Howdy guys, I'm John Grimsmo and this is Knife Making Tuesday week 60. Can you believe it? 60 already, holy cow. So this week we're finishing up the back side of all of our handles and we're making pocket clips. This is a tip I learned from a Strider picture where they sort them by fives alternating. Thought that was a pretty good idea. Right now it's doing thread milling, thread milling a couple hundred uh, 440 holes. And I am very happy to report that this thread mill has probably done 500 holes now for one thread mill. I used to break them all the time because I didn't have my settings right. Now I've got them nailed down. So excited about that. I know it's hard to see what's going on in there, but... It's a little tool that looks just like a screw. And it's going around and around and cutting those threads. It does it in four passes. Three cutting passes with one spring pass. Very, very, very light cutting. Just taking off a few tenths each time. But each hole takes 26 seconds, that's not too bad. So yeah, it's awesome to be able to machine a whole pallet, like just one sheet of titanium, in one go. Nine pairs of handles and a whole bunch of clips. Pulling really good vacuum, the new air compressor rocks the house. Keeps up with our demands, no problem. Hey guys, so the parts are going really, really good. Just finished another pallet here. This one's a little bit different because all the backside work is done except I didn't cut it out. I didn't profile the parts like I did for these ones. Uh, there's a few reasons why I did that, but basically um, the way I had them nested together, like how tight they were, they don't, this way, they don't directly flip over onto the other pallet. Um, so we have to break them apart like this. Like the, the vertical columns um, can stay that way, but each row has to be broken off from itself, and that was really annoying to do. Even though I left it pretty thin, it was still really annoying to do. Um, so I'm going to try doing it this way, where, do, where we do all the backside work except for the profiling, and then when I flip it over and attach it to the other fixture, then we can profile it from the top, because it's, each handle will be attached to that fixture via two pins and four to five screws. So it's not going anywhere on that other fixture. So profiling it and cutting it out on that fixture will work totally awesome. Um, and I think it's just a better way to do it, because otherwise I'm repeating things. I'm profiling two or three times instead of just rough pass and then finish pass. It's like rough pass, rough pass, and then finish pass. Anyway, um, yeah, so things are going awesome. New logo looks wicked. A few minutes ago I said that uh, that thread mill I was using lasted forever. Um, shortly after that it broke 
and uh, I'm not sure exactly why, but possibly chips got into the hole, like the coolant wasn't in the exact right spot. So it broke, um, but that was after doing like four or five hundred holes. I didn't keep exact count, but it was easily four or five hundred, which is pretty awesome. Um, so I can't complain about you know breaking that. Maybe it maybe it wore out for all I know. So I'll keep an eye on that in future runs, and you know if its lifespan is five hundred holes, then you replace it, or you just wait till it breaks, and then um, just redo the holes that it didn't break, which is what I did now, and it worked fine. So. I'm getting to ready to ready to run one last sheet. Shink. Um, so this will be my last sheet for this batch, and I've got ten tools that it takes to do all the backside milling operations, and um, I'm starting to get to the point of you know higher volume production where the tools are actually starting to wear out, um, which is a quality problem to have as opposed to just breaking tools due to stupid mistakes or speeds and feeds being wrong. Um, so I'm getting to the point where I have to check every tool um, after each sheet, after each pallet, for wear, so that I don't uh, you know, start using a dull tool where I should be using a sharp tool. So I'm just going to go over that real quick, um, how I check the tools. There's a couple tools that are high wear, there's a couple tools that seem to last forever, um, like the drills last a pretty good time. I use cobalt drills. Um, the engraving end mill lasts for a really, really long time. I've been using that same tool for about eight months or something. Um, but things like, uh, well, the drill bits, they should be checked often. Some of the end mills um, should be checked often. And especially things like where you're cutting the bearing pocket, you want that tool to be sharp and accurate every time. So let's start with um, the drill bit. So I fetch tool number five, and I'll take it out, and I'll just like look at it real close. Now I go over here, I go over here, and I've got um, a little loop that I can look at it under the fluorescent light, look at it really close. So this I actually pulled out of a scanner, a broken scanner that I tore apart, and I found a sweet little magnifying glass. I don't know what the uh, uh, magnification is, but it's probably two or three or four times. Um, I'd like to get something a little bit bigger with maybe five or ten times magnification. That would be awesome. Something I can mount onto an arm or something and just not have to hold it. But yeah, so I basically, you know, look like this. I got some nice sunshine coming in on my face right now. Um, so I can look like this really close. I can look really close at the edges and see if there's any chips. Um, if there's any broken parts, if it's discolored, which this drill bit is a little discolored on the cutting edges. It still looks sharp, but it's, um, you know, it's a gold-colored end mill, or uh, drill bit, but the cutting edges are sort of burnt looking. So, I think out of uh, just safety, I'm going to replace this drill bit because it costs all of two dollars. Whereas the sheet of titanium, I don't want to ruin that, you know. Two dollars versus a huge sheet of titanium. Very expensive stuff. So I'm going to just go ahead and replace that and throw it away. Um, and then go through all the other drill, uh, all the other end mills, and I, I did just check them all. Um, and they look fine. So let's call tool 9. I don't know if I've shown it up close, but this is the thread mill that I keep talking about. See, it basically looks just like a screw, except it's got cutting edges. So as it rotates, it rotates around and around a hole and threads itself in there and cuts threads very awesomely. So yeah, this is the last one that I have. And I have one more pallet to do, so hopefully each pallet has about 126 holes, I think. Hopefully it'll last. And then uh, I can worry about buying more later. Actually, I, I lied. I do need this for my thumb studs. 
um, which will be about 180 of those. I don't need to make 180, but it happens to work out that I can make 180. So hopefully, we'll see. Wow, that sun is really bright coming in the window. <laughs> but you can see me. One thing I want to talk about real quick is something really cool called lights out machining. Um, for the longest time I'd never heard this term, but then I heard about it and it was very intriguing. And uh, you know, I'm nowhere near the sophistication of complete lights out machining. I mean, these big machine shops uh, literally put parts in and go home for the night and by the time they get there in the morning the parts are done. But I'm not far away from it. Yeah, I'm sort of pseudo lights out machining. Um, if it's a job that I've run a few times and I'm really comfortable with and I know I know the ins and outs, I know the worry spots and all that, um, like this palette of, of handles, handle backsides, um, I'm comfortable going inside and having lunch and playing with my kids and um, you know just trusting the machine to do what it's going to do. If it breaks an end mill, oh well it breaks an end mill. Um, sometimes end mills um, stack up on top of each other, meaning that you know one end mill makes a hole and then another end mill uses that hole to do something else. And if the first one breaks, then the second one's going to break, then the third one's going to break. Um, so sometimes they stack up like that, but not all the time. And um, so you got to be careful with that, and that's why I would check the tools often to see if they wear out, so you can trust them more. And if you have to replace them early, well, you can trust them still. Um, because as much as I would love to be out here eight, ten hours a day staring at the machine, um, I can't. I don't have the time to do that. But I also really want the machine to be running for eight or ten hours a day because that would just be fantastic. So I'm trying to get to the point where I can trust the machine enough to walk away and come back and trust that everything worked. And I'm getting there. There's a couple operations like the profiling. Um, like I mentioned before, I stopped doing that on the back sides. That's a really aggressive operation. And, um, you know, a lot can go wrong. The end mill can break, which it has on me a few times. Um, etc, etc. And I, I don't trust that leaving it by itself. So what I had on that run was um, I had a stop in the program that'll just wait for me to come out here and push go and then it'll do the profile pass. It takes about 45 minutes and then I have to watch it the whole time. So for some of these runs, you know, they go for several hours at a time. and So it's nice to be able to walk away for a couple hours and come back and the machine's, you know, done. It's done its work and it didn't, didn't break anything. And I'll peek in every now and then and check to see if the tool is still there, and if it is, then great. But uh, especially when we're doing big runs, lots more stuff going on. Um, yeah, like right now we're all in machining mode, and then once the machining is done, we got to finish them all, like sand them and uh, scotch bread the edges, get them tumbled and all that. But there's not a lot of hand work to do right now, um, so we're just watching the Tormac do its job. And then after that, we can uh, hopefully run more parts, other parts, while we're in the garage fiddling with other stuff, sanding and sharpening and setting up knives and all that. Anywho, that'll probably conclude the back side of the handles. I could film more, but whatever. Um, so tonight, I'm, it's dinner time now, so I'm going to put on a pallet and then go in for dinner. And then uh, it'll pause just before the thread mill, and then I come back out here whenever that's done. It takes Oh, a while to get there. Yeah, and then when that's done, uh, I'm going to go inside. i got to edit a video for tomorrow. Not this one, the week before. And, um, and then, uh, what else? And then tonight, I'm going to code the top side of the handles. Where it's going to profile them, do the corner rounder, do the honeycomb pattern, the diamond pattern, cut the screw head holes, the pivot head hole, a um, couple little details and accents and stuff, and then do the same for the pocket clips too. Profile, corner round, engrave the logo, and uh, yeah. So hopefully I'll have some of that film in this video as well. So another kind of interesting thing I wanted to point out, well I think it's interesting, which means some of you will find it interesting too, especially you guys who have your own machines at home. Um, a lot of operations require a lot of different drill bits, reamers, whatever. Um, so like here I've got my 93 thou drill bit in a drill bit holder, keyless chuck, and then I've got the same drill bit in a collet chuck with a 116, no, a, a 332nd uh, collet in it, ER32 collet, no, ER20, ER20 collet. Um, anyway, you can see the height difference there. 
And for something that I'm trying to keep more hands off so that it'll work um, while I'm doing other stuff, um, if you've got all these tools, I think you're about on the same plane, you see that all the, it's full of ER, ER20 collets. And if you stick a long drill bit in there, and your coolant is pointing, it's always pointing right about here, and you stick a long drill bit in there, it's going to shoot coolant right at the side of the drill bit, not down at the tip where it needs it to be. And that's not cool, because then your drill bit's not getting cool. And, um, so I started using a collet holder for the drill bit as well, which is good. And uh, now all my tools are, like the coolant can spray pretty much just under the nut on all the tools and it hits the cutting edge, um, which is super handy because then I don't have to go in there and keep dicking around with the coolant height. Um, so that's pretty awesome. And then I've got one longer reamer here, but it uh, spins at such a slow RPM, like 500 RPM or so, that uh, it doesn't fling the coolant away and it just sort of grabs the coolant and shoots it straight down the shaft of the reamer, which is kind of cool. So, there's a fun fact for you. Alright, before I go inside for dinner, there's one thing I did want to show. When I start the pallet, I've got a vacuum down, you can hear the vacuum on right now. Um, because these sheets of titanium, they're a little weird. They're supposed to be 0.125, but they like, they differ, they taper. Could be like 126, 135, 130. And that, you know, 5 to 10 thou difference can really make or break um, some of the parts that I'm doing. So I'm going to probe every handle thickness and have the machine remember that so that as it's machining, it can machine down from the exact top surface, not from a guesstimated 0.125 inch. So this is the operation for that. It's going to go down to about 2 inches. Then it goes down real slow until it touches, and then goes back up, moves to the next location. To me, this is really, really cool because it gets very, very accurate results. Every single sheet is individually probed. Um, for every run of code so that I know exactly the, the thing I'm doing is exactly the right distance from the surface. I think that's awesome. Had a bit of a snafu yesterday, um, so I'm machining this sheet. It machines to about here, but then it leaves four inches of extra here, so I flipped it over, and now I'm machining some lefty handles out of this extra four inches. And I was doing all the spotting, 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 and then I had to stop it and change something, because all these holes are wrong. Um, so after I changed it, then I started up again, and it moves to the next one, and it just goes crunch, crack, crash. All the way through the titanium into the fixture. Lost vacuum, of course, so that the whole sheet kind of lifts up now. Destroyed my drill mill. It still kind of looks like a drill mill, but it's missing about a quarter inch. And, um, yeah, that was no fun. And, of course, that's the last drill mill that I have had. So, yeah, I was um, kind of stuck and very disappointed. Um, not a big deal to lose this section of titanium, it's just an extra pocket clip that I don't really need, so that's no big deal. But um, kind of a annoying, so now I have to seal off this hole from vacuum so that it doesn't uh, suck air through it. Anywho, um, so to replace that drill mill, I got a whole bunch of stuff from Lakeshore Carbide. And um, 
yeah, of course I can't just buy one thing, so I had to buy like a whole ton of, ton of stuff because I need it. And it was an excuse to buy lots of stuff, so I did. Here's my replacement. Quarter inch, four flute drill mill from Lakeshore. Uh, this is a four flute, whereas the other one has two flutes. Uh, four flute, just all the benefits with twice the feed rate. So you get to push it twice as fast. Nothing wrong with that. So, and they're really good because they're good for spotting, light spotting applications, and of course for chamfering. So I chamfer this, this area right here, and spot all the holes. It's not the best tool for spotting. I got a better one for that, but I don't use it all the time. This guy here is a much better tool for spotting. This is a carbide spot drill. You can see it looks kind of just like a drill bit, except it's carbide and has a thicker core than a regular drill bit. So this is what you really want to be using for spotting all the holes, but my holes are very light. I'm only spotting down like, I don't know, 40 thou or something. Um, and the drill mill seems to work just fine for doing that. And my tool changer is full of 10 tools, so you sort of have to make some tools multi-purpose. So this one I spot and chamfer. Another sheet of handles all done. It looks a lot different without having them actually cut out so you can see what the heck each one is. But yeah. Got three clips laid on the side there. And um, up here I got a whole bunch of clips going this way. Um, the last three being lefty clips. And there's three pairs of handles here that are all lefties as well. Making lefties is a huge pain in the butt. So you guys getting them, just be very thankful. Because I basically had to do code everything all over again, but backwards. And uh, it just took a long time. But yeah, it's going pretty good, so pretty good. So now this can come off. Notice no through holes. It's vacuumed down. You can see the O-ring there. Big gasket. Um, I did have a bit of a crash over here. You can see big holes, so I just moved the gasket over to the corner, and it uh, works fine. Had a bit of an issue over here. I don't think I've showed this yet. We've got a whole bunch of our pocket clips mounted to the pocket clip fixture. Um, so we're making use of our old water jet pocket clips that have mounting tabs that are pointless to us. You can see underneath here there are more mounting holes. So we could actually nest more in here, but because of the water jet tabs, we can't. So that's okay. It'll just do some air cutting in here, and no big deal. Um, but yeah, so, and then these sheets are a bunch of pocket clips, I think three high. Um, so basic operations for the pocket clips are to rough out the profile, which will cut off the tabs and all the extra junk, and then finish profile, and then corner around the top, and then engrave the logo. And that should do it. So tonight I'm going to code the pocket clip code stuff. And um, yeah, and this whole section down here, um, this whole section down here will be dedicated to thumb studs and spacers. Yes, I will be milling my thumb studs and spacers. Sneak peek of that right here. This is a piece of Damascus. And these are a whole bunch of thumb studs. So they're thread milled from the back side for 440 thread and then I can thread them onto the fixture here. Like so. Um, yeah, you may, these may look like they're just placed on here, but nay, they is actually screwed in from the back side. Guess you can't really see in there. And then this fixture will bolt onto this fixture. So this guy, let's see if I can do this one-handed. Um, you can see over here there's some alignment pins. 
There's one on each side. This fixture gets sucked down. It's got bolt holes here, here, and 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 here, that bolt it down to the sub-fixture. And then the sub-fixture is a vacuum fixture. So that gets vacuumed down to the vac magic. And it is magical. So I had mostly good success machining my new pocket clip. The only thing that messed up on was the corner rounder up at the top there. You can see it undercut right there. Um, I don't know, every time I, I output a corner rounder code for the first time, it's always quite a bit deeper than I expected to, even though I put the right settings in. It's like I have to manually compensate for it. Anyway, uh, so once I change that, you can see the ugly part at the top, but then on the sides I changed it, like I stopped it before it made too much ugly. And it made the sides really nice, all the way up to the front. Profile pass looks really good. I could probably make it a tiny bit better. As far as uh, surface finish goes. But I'm super happy with it so far. Logo turned out great. I think I'll make it a little bit bigger. Because it's just, uh, it, it can be. Why not? So I'll take it almost all the way to the edge of that corner rounder. And it'll be a little bit taller because of that. But yeah, so threaded holes in the back, nothing showing up from the top. That's going to be wicked. Awesome. Turned out really good. Except for the corner rounder, but that's fixed. So I've got a bunch of other pocket clips. You can see the first one came out right there. Bunch of other ones to machine. So once I fix the corner rounder, I think I'm good to go for all the rest of these and just let it run. You know, you always want to test just one, um, so you don't potentially ruin all of these, even if you have to test a bunch of different times. Um, as you can see, the titanium just has a bunch of scratches in it. That's just how you get it. Not much you can do about that. Um, so for this one at the bottom of the screen, I did try to face it down, but it vibrated a lot right in the middle because, as you can see, the bottoms are already machined uh, under, underneath the clip. So there's this thin section, and that vibrated quite a bit. So I don't think that's going to work. So we're just going to have to disc sand them and uh, scotch brite them down. No big deal. No big whatsoevs. But little stuff like uh, Eric put a Dremel mark into this one accidentally. Right there. Oh well. And the, the color, you know, it's gray as opposed to silver. Like the machine silver or sanded polished silver or whatever. So you just got to get that out. Not a big deal. It takes a few seconds, maybe a minute per clip. Maximum. So, And then we'll probably get them all tumbled just so that they all have that awesome stonewashed finish. Got the clip all polished up, scotch braided. I um, disc sanded the face a little bit just to get some of the bigger scratches out. This is still that nasty one. But uh, I just wanted to see how it shines up. And I had a little bit of fun with the logo. I anodized just the logo itself blue and then scotch braided the surface down again. And straight on, you almost can't even tell, but at the angle, you know, this, the logo just pops. So if, if the clip were to stay silver, then to have a colored logo like that would be sweet. But, you know, if the clip gets all blue, then that changes things. Especially at an angle like this, the contrast just really shows it. But straight on, it almost doesn't. In the glare. But yeah. Clip done. Very, very happy with how these are turning out. Yep, love it. Super awesome. Here's another thing we've got in the works. This is one of our blades palettes. Um, so we've got a bunch of blades mounted here. The clamps, they look kind of funky right now. Um, like we just made them. And they still have to be, I'm going to contour the clamp so that it follows the curvature of the grind. And uh, so I'm going to machine them while they're mounted up like this. So I've got an end mill that's going to, you know, cut the clamp itself without touching the blade, hopefully. 
and it's just going to cut all these at once. Um, when we do final milling on these blades, we're pretty much just going to be using this clamp and maybe a screw through this pivot or a, a, another little clamp on the side or something like that, but not this big one, I don't, I don't think. Um, maybe. Because as you can see, the step underneath the clamp is extra material. Like this hole between my fingers right now is extra and that's going to be cut off. Um, but yeah, so it might actually work to have both clamps on there. But basically the clamps are opposite each other. You can see the bolts go this way and then this way. And that's so when we flip the blade over, the clamp follows the contour of the blade. So it's basically a left clamp and a right clamp. Um, yeah. So the cool thing is we have two of these fixtures, two identical fixtures, so that while the machine is machining one fixture, we can be loading up the second fixture with all this, which takes quite a little bit of time. So pretty efficient uh, work once, once we get going. Um, you know, you got to have your code perfect and trustworthy and be able to just trust it and go. Otherwise, it's constant tweaks, constant dicking around, constant uh, back and forth, back and forth, trying to get things streamlined and perfect. And we're getting there. So doing the pocket clip testing, I've just messing with my speeds and feeds, trying to get the best surface finish on the side. So I've got the three tests there, plus the original. I did go ahead and make the logo bigger. I think it looks epic. And then... My brother Eric's been busy uh, producing. And he gave them all a quick buzz on the disc sander with some worn out 220 grid paper. So the surface finish is getting there. We'll probably bump it up to 600 grit and then scotch bright and then tumble or something like that. And then you're going to look awesome. And then we've got one more pallet here with not quite completely full but a bunch of randoms. And then the four Damascus ones that I should be able to get away with the exact same speeds and feeds as titanium for this purpose because it's not removing a ton of metal. So, last thing for this week, Eric's been itching to, to uh, etch one of these Damascus clips, and he just did, and holy crap. On the left is a plain titanium clip, a polished Damascus clip, so you can hardly even see the pattern, and then an etched clip. He etched that for about, I think he said 18 minutes in muriatic acid. Didn't have to polish it at all afterwards, he just polished it really well beforehand. So, one of the metals in the dam of steel got etched and the other one stayed shiny. He said, uh, the last few minutes there, the shiny metal started to get a little bit duller. So maybe after 15 minutes or so, um, it would have been shiny still, but like super shiny. But, oh my goodness, that just looks fabulous. And on the bottom actually it looks really funny because with the the milling marks and the Damascus put together, it just makes it look really goofy. But you don't see the bottom. Notice the Damascus ones don't have the engraving on it because I made these quite a long time ago and these more recently. So anywho, ha oh, ha yeah. Oh, these Damascus ones, fantastic. There you go. Well, there you have it, guys. That's it for this week's video. Next week, I'm going to be doing the top side of all the handles. And uh, I actually have code right here on my USB stick um, to start cutting those right now. So, that's going to be very fun. There are 29 separate operations just for the top side of the handles using 10 tools. Pretty cool stuff. Anyway, guys, see you next week. Thanks. Bye.